Did you do anything crazy this weekend? Yeah. So I uh, went downtown and um, saw a bird eating some throw up. Welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. And I'm Jacqueline Batts. And we're the co- who? I'm sorry, Justin Plant. I'm uh, Justin Plant. Okay, yes, that's that's what I'm used to. Um, so Jacqueline and I are the glue that keeps this engine running. Yeah. To mix metaphors. Here at Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business, we're like the Bellatrix to your Voldemort. That was perfect. That was good. That was, mm-hmm. that was good. Because only cowards don't say his name, right? <laughs> yeah. As you may notice, uh, Justin is not with me today. We are joined here by our producer, project manager, account manager. Uh, Ready. The, the Jacqueline of all trades. Our Jacqueline of all trades, Jacqueline Batts. Um, we are going to be talking about everything to do with freelancers today. And Jacqueline, I want you to introduce yourself to our lovely audience uh, momentarily. But okay. I understand that you've brought a sponsor with you. Yes. So um, the lovely brand Beer Gear has come out with a new product that I'm very excited to tell you all about. All right. So this episode's sponsor is Beer Gear. Mm-hmm. Stick around later and you can hear all about their brand new product. Uh, Jacqueline, why don't you uh, tell the good people a little bit about yourself? Okay, how far back you want me to go? Um, let's keep this to a tight eight or nine minutes. Eight or n- okay. So when I was three years old, <laughs> um, so let's see. I well, I'll go back to when I was younger. At so. least get scad in there. Oh, okay. Well, I feel like that's like a legitimacy. That's like five thing. years okay. ago. All right. So, so when you were eight. When I was eight, made a bunch of home movies. So much fun. Loved videos. Loved making movies. Everything. Um, so when I went to college, I went to NC State for my undergrad and did film studies. So learned that I loved it. Um, and then I decided to go to SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design, for my master's degree in um, film production with a track in producing. I so, see. Yep. Yeah, that led me to do a bunch of random weird jobs while searching for the right job. <laughs> If you want to hear about those, I can tell you. I do, actually. Okay. Well, the fun, it was a bunch of like um, bank jobs like that. The weirdest job I had Wait, was. Wait, I didn't know this. You didn't know I worked at a bank? So did I. Really? What did you do? I was a um, teller person, drive through yep. teller. Totally did the teller thing. Really? Yep. We'll have a lot to talk about later. Okay. Um, and then I <laughs> went. <laughs> How long have we been working together? <laughs> a what? year? T- only 10 months. I haven't been only a year Only 10 yet. months? Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then I went door to door selling office supplies. Okay, that actually explains quite a bit about your office Amazon purchases. Okay, <laughs> yeah, Got it. I guess so. Um, I worked at a gym. Okay. And um, yeah, and then finally I got a job at an agency where I was able to dabble, 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 and be dabble, dabble, and um, in video which led me to Storyboard Media. So wait, this is the good job? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, that's that's good to know. Now talk a little bit about about the freelancer side of what it is you do for us, just to kind of set up why you're here since this is our topic today. Yeah, so I am the one who uh, finds some talent, like in addition with your help, of course. Um, find some people to work with and build our team, you know, in the specifics for video. So we have our in-house team Mm -hmm. and then we want to reach out to specific people who do those. Like, so for lighting, gaffers, um, uh, DPs, editors, everything like that. We want those people who are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? You know what I'm talking about? Good fit. Yeah. Good fit yeah. and like our specialized, specialized, that's what I was looking there for. There we go. Um, in that to help us out. So my job is to find freelancers and then also just be the main point of communication for them throughout the entire process. So that, um, you know, give them what they're supposed to do, deadlines, timelines, and just be there for any questions. Okay. So perhaps we can rely on your um, insights and maybe some of the mistakes that you've made and help keep some of our listeners from making the same mistakes. Yeah. That's the hope here. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to start the conversation around 
when to use freelance help versus what you should have in house. Mm -hmm. And I think the traditional model for an agency, video agency or otherwise, is that the the account management, the creative and the strategic kind of stay in house. Mm -hmm. Everything else are things that that can be farmed out to freelancers. Yeah. So anywhere from uh, writers, storyboard artists, um, hair and makeup, mm -hmm. all that on set crew, yeah. um, editors, animators, post sound, um, data analysts. Uh, all you know, if you're looking at all seven phases, mm -hmm. there are a whole lot of people who can bring who can bring help from a freelancer standpoint. I think what what we've tried to do recently is challenge a little bit of the certain core elements need to remain in house. Um, and, and I think to me it comes down to process. The better defined your processes are for uh, creative leadership, strategic mm -hmm. leadership, um, even accounts leadership, which is something we haven't dabbled in from a freelance perspective. But, but bringing in freelancers on a creative and strategic um, projects, I think can actually work as long as you've trained them on what is your fundamental process. Mm -hmm. um, we've recently brought on five freelance mm -hmm. strategists. Yeah. Um, who who have worked with me on three springboards, mm -hmm. uh, and they're at varying stages, but there's kind of a moment so far with each of them where something has clicked. Mm -hmm. They're like, ah, I get this, and and only one of the five has professional experience in video. Yes, right, that's true. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is we've taken strategists, freelance contract. Um, content strategists and been able to convert them to video strategists. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that long term I wouldn't still have somebody managing that group in house. I do think that's important. Yeah. But again, with our springboards, we've established such a process, such a repeatable process, that we have found success bringing freelancers in to to conduct those on kind of a repeating basis, even though they're not in house employees. Yeah. Any other roles that we've tried to um, maybe bring in contractors on that, that feel like they should be more in-house or vice versa? Things that you might think, oh, well, we need somebody full time for this, but you could actually use multiple freelancers. Yeah, kind of like the the whole social and then video distribution okay. thing. I think that um, if we could find someone who could do all of that then we could probably bring them in-house, but that also can be separated into different um, categories. Like you can have someone doing social, a uh, freelancer doing social for us, uh, doing social for a client, and then someone else completely just doing um, like the data analytics for mm -hmm. any kind of distribution. I think we got spoiled with our most recent- Yes, I think so. Uh, social media manager, because <laughs> he was capable of doing all those things and and, uh, and he got a full-time job somewhere, in-house somewhere, to do that, and we wish him the best. <laughs> but I've also made very clear to him that should he not like that job, he is more than welcome to come back to us. Welcome with opened arms. Yes. I think there's a way to take an expectation of what would be a larger role, mm -hmm. or maybe especially the smaller the per video agency, production company, marketing team, the, the smaller that team is, everybody like just by necessity has to wear multiple hats. Yeah. And so I think that's I think that's um an opportunity to to look at at a couple things. One, do you find that freelancer who is really good at multiple things and then how do you create mm -hmm. a full-time job in-house job for them? Yeah. But also how can you look at what you feel like should be a full-time job and like you were saying, break it down into its parts. Mm -hmm. And maybe there are smaller freelance agreements that, that you can have where somebody can be more specialized, spend mm -hmm. less time yeah. working on overall, wearing one hat instead of multiple hats. And that, that still may, uh, you might actually get better talent, I well, think, if, if you take that approach. Yeah, and plus, since you know the COVID situation, a lot more people are more interested in being a freelancer for multiple companies too. 
that's 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 been a huge change. Mm-hmm. We have um, between you and me, we have. I don't want to say interviewed, but we have <laughs> um, talked to, conversated. talked to, communicated with, yeah. sought applica- sought and reviewed applications <laughs> yeah. for so many more freelancers this year than than I think we've done in our seven years combined up to this point. It's been a lot, um, yeah. and it continues. And yeah, I think that's one of the biggest things is is we were o- often in an interesting position because freelancers didn't want to be freelancers they wanted to have a lot of them wanted to have that stability and so you could offer them that stability um and yet it's completely flipped so many of the freelancers that we've talked to if it starts as a um an individual project but then goes on to something that's more of an ongoing contract kind of thing Mm -hmm. they may be open to the ongoing contract but they're still like but i really need to maintain my my other freelance clients yeah and that's been it that's been a big um that's been a big shift just in what in what we're hearing Mm -hmm. let let's shift a little bit and let's talk about where we try to find these people yeah and there was a time perhaps before you but Mm -hmm. but maybe after you started where where occasion so so I think first it starts with your network. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, before you started working with us, you had worked with Holden Kim before. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Holden, what's up, Holden? Um, <laughs> Holden was the first freelancer that Justin and I ever brought on. Oh, really? We brought yeah. him on as an editor, even though he he at that time was more of an animator mm-hmm. than an editor. Um, we met Holden at a Panera. Okay in Cary. Yeah. As a two-person company, we we didn't know what it would be like to hand work off to someone. Um but but we got to hold in from a networking event that we went to at a local agency. Um and and there were, we were just sitting at a table with a guy who uh worked at another agency. Mhm. I won't say which because they're kind of weird about yeah. what they let their employees do. <laughs> um, who said, hey, if you need an editor or an animator, guy I work with is fantastic. He just mm-hmm. left the company and he's gone out as a freelancer and he's looking for work. And that is how we met Holden the first yeah. time. Um, and that was a big step. Mm-hmm. Now, um, well, and that's another thing we should talk about too. Um, is how freelancers evolve over the course of when you work with them too. Because yeah. I think Holden is an interesting case of how his uh, interests and technical abilities, how he's pushed himself to grow and how that has changed our relationship with him. Uh, let's try to remember to come back to that. Yeah, circle back. Um, should we just make this whole episode about Holden? I think so. And then <laughs> not tell him about it until it's released and yeah. see if he see if he catches it. <laughs> so it started just, just by, by meeting someone who recommended someone. And then, of course, I mean, I don't even know that we had a good sense of how to qualify a freelancer at that point. Yeah. It was like, let's just see if this works. And it worked. Um, now, if you jump forward to kind of exhausting your network um, and you've you've kind of brought in all of the people that uh that are friends of friends and mm-hmm. freelancers of freelancers and and all those kinds of people uh, eventually you kind of max that group out and you understand who you work well with who you maybe don't work so well with not necessarily because you or they aren't good at what you do it's mm-hmm. just that it's fit yeah. right a lot of the time it's fit um at some point you have to start sourcing new talent and i think we've had varying results with some of the channels that we've tried i think so with that yeah um on the very low end i would call out upwork yeah so upwork is a place where i know david posted several jobs over the course of of i want to say 2019 and 2020. i think i th- I think I've only used it once okay. since being here. And I think we've met some interesting people, mm-hmm. but I don't think, and I'm sure there are some very talented people on there, but nothing ever really clicked for us on anyone that, that we met with Upwork, and I'm not even sure we ended up giving any work to anyone Oh yeah, that we met through Upwork. I think the one that I did, 
we ended up working with them. But it was from a different state, so it was like we're probably not going to go back there. Upwork, Fiverr. I mean, uh, there, there are several of those you, can, yeah. you could group together. I think those are uh, hit and miss at best. And buyer beware. <laughs> um, I think on our digital tools episode, we talked about like voices.com, voice123. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And I would say the same, same feedback applies to Upwork and Fiverr is make sure that uh, before you reach out to someone, um, or, or engage in a conversation with someone, make sure that they've got a decent amount of work yes. through the site. They've got a certain amount of reviews because also largely due to COVID, a lot of people who think they're, they're professional freelancers have put themselves on these platforms where they aren't vetted and there are a lot of unqualified yeah. people um, on a lot of these sites now. Um, and you just have to spend that much more time uh paying attention to the work that they've done yeah uh because it's real easy to find someone who writes really well and speaks really well about themselves but then can't deliver the work exactly we then tried an approach this year that i think was moderately successful i think so well mm. successful <laughs> in a way that we got a lot of answers or yeah. responses yeah so so we had four roles we had four freelance slash slightly longer term contract roles yeah. that that we knew as we were growing this year we were going to need help with. Mm -hmm. Some was an absolute immediate like needed at three weeks ago need. Some of it was more of a building up the roster kind of need. So we had writers, uh, freelancer contract, creative lead, strategic lead, and freelance video editors. Yes. And for the writers, David has managed that app, that um, that posting and those applicants mm -hmm. himself, so yeah. that he could review them and basically kick out anybody that he didn't feel like was going to be a good fit, and then engage in conversations with people who had good writing samples, things like that. Yep. And so he's been able to add three or four people to our roster of writers mm -hmm. that he feels like he could work well with. Yes. Um, at least one of which is working on a current project for us. Mm -hmm. um, great. Um, <laughs> Success. Then, so I, I think it's worth mentioning part of the trick here too is because we don't have the type of LinkedIn premium account where you're like a recruiter. Yes, yeah. Um, you, your baseline LinkedIn account, you're allowed to post one free job posting per user at a time. So what we did was we distributed the posts among <laughs> our internal team. I guarantee you nobody from LinkedIn is listening. So <laughs> Who um, knows? But it did make it more difficult. And so I it did. think that's fine with, with, okay. So because we felt like the writers would have writing samples that they would submit and the editors we were going to get a bunch of applications and mm -hmm. we needed to find a more um volume way yeah we needed to find a way to kind of vet them internally more than what we would get from their linkedin profile or a free linkedin job application and so i'll come come back to that and then the the freelance or contract uh, creative lead and strategist were things that we figured would be low applications and uh, based on a quick review of whether they've got any kind of creative direction experience or content strategy experience, it, I was then sending them invitations for a 15 minute one on one conversation. Yes. Um, and deliberately 15 minutes. Um, because 15 minutes is all I felt like I needed to explain what I really meant the job was supposed to be mm -hmm. outside of the job description and could really quickly get a sense for whether this was someone who could actually do that role or somebody who was just applying. Just to apply. Just to apply. They saw freelance. And, and I cannot tell you it was six. So I guess I can tell you six of like <laughs> the first 12 or 14 people that I actually talked to said some version of in that 15 minute conversation can you remind me what i applied for oh man 
Just like a batch, sending out batch resumes, yes. basically. <laughs> and so that made our 15-minute meeting shorter. Yeah. Um, but it also helped then. There were a few people that I was able to identify as people who could warrant further conversation, further discussion about what we really need out of the role. Mm-hmm. Um, again, we've, we've mentioned that we have brought on five uh, freelance strategists recently. Mm-hmm. F- three of them were a result of those posts. That's true. Yeah. Um, one yeah. of them was somebody who was already in our network as a, um, as a freelancer, a mm-hmm. recurring freelancer. Um, and one of them was someone you knew. Yes. Yes. Yeah. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. My network. Yes. Your network. Then we get to our video editors since I've been talking for a while. <laughs> why don't you break down the different approach that we took for our freelance video editors? Yeah. So we got a plethora is that a good word? It's a great word. Of video editor applications. So because we didn't want Ben to spend, what, a whole week just combing through Probably each could have, yeah. editor application, we decided to kind of break down and put those in the, a Google Doc, um, breaking down like what location, real. Um, well, so, so first, yeah. a plethora was... 89 applicants in the first 24 hours. That was just the first time too, right? That, yes. So that was posting it as a freelance job on mm-hmm. LinkedIn, 89 applicants in the first 24 hours. And th- yeah, that was, it was a lot. It was a lot. It was a lot. Um, but before the Google Doc, it was the type form. That's right. See, it's all getting mixed up with all the approaches we had to take. Yep. But we we created a type form survey, kind of breaking down uh, specific questions about, you know, how many years editing have they been? What is their proficiency in Adobe um, Premiere, After Effects, um, you know, rate, everything like that. And then at the very end of the type form, um, we put a a link to record your own video, kind of giving a brief introduction of yourself. Um, and it was, it was not required, but highly recommended. I think those are the exact words. Exact. Yeah. And so, I mean, when it got to the point of us reviewing them, we primarily watched the ones that only had the video. That's where we started. Yeah. Cause I mean, that was, I mean, we're a video agency, so let's see how these people were. <laughs> exactly. Even if it's just a quick <laughs> webcam introduction. Um, I, these numbers may be a little bit off, but of those 89 applicants in the first 24 hours, and I think, I think it ended up being 114 by the time we actually developed that type form kind of like internal application. Mm-hmm. Um, cause what we were trying to do with that was we were trying to build out the roster so that we could go through and, and search this data later on. Um, so if we wanted somebody who we knew, for example, had a lot of experience editing scripted content yep. for many years and uh, measured themselves as, as a master level proficiency in um, Premiere Pro and Adobe Audition because it was going to be audio. I mean, whatever. We would have all of those data points to be able to search through and come up with a short list mm-hmm. so that then whenever that situation presented itself, then we could find that short list of people and figure out who we wanted to approach um, about the project. Yeah. So um, of that, that, that first 48 hours, 114, whatever it was, <laughs> I sent out 50 of these type form applications. Yeah. Uh, links to 50. 44 of those 50 people filled it out. But how many did the video? 14. Okay. 17, something yeah. like that. Uh, <clears throat> but I was still yeah. amazed that 44, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it's one thing to just like click apply on LinkedIn. Exactly. Or like the fast apply, you know, easy apply. Yes. It's, it's another thing for for 44 of the 50 people who then got a LinkedIn message from me following up saying, hey, I saw that you applied. I'd like for you to fill out this information. Mm -hmm. It was not not a short survey. It was was very, where can we see your work? What type of stuff do you like working on? Mm -hmm. Um, How do you like to operate? Are you more of a, give me the footage and I'll disappear for a week and Mm -hmm. come back? Are you more iterative? I mean, 
there was a lot of detail in there deliberately, one, to weed out the less motivated. Yes. And and two, to get that level of information so that we could kind of pick and choose who we wanted to then have follow-up conversations with. Well, I think it also helped that they received a like personal message from you as well. Because if it was sure. just a automated send out survey, I, I bet not as many people would have filled it out because they were like, oh, I have a chance now. Like, Yeah, no, you're, you're probably right. Um, and so, um, you know, two days after mm-hmm. uh, I sent out those 50, um, we then pulled up a screen with all of the video introductions and started with all the people who sent video introductions. Mm-hmm. And that was our first wave of, of reviewing people. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that there aren't or weren't perfectly qualified people in there. It's just that when when you're looking at that much, I mean, I guess I would say this to someone as a freelancer, if, if you're listening, the more that I can understand about you and, and, and the more that I can get a sense of, of who you are and if you might be a good fit, like more data is better than less data. Well, plus it's like there's a specific atmosphere and culture here that we want to be able to mesh with. And it's so much easier to kind of see your personality and everything by the video that you do. So because I don't know there was a lot of those videos where like, oh, we definitely get along with them. Like they're, you know. Well, and there were a couple where somebody didn't even say anything. <laughs> You're gonna, we're gonna have to pause this because I'm gonna start laughing so much. I have never <laughs> seen you laugh as hard as you did with this guy's oh two goodness. videos. I just felt, I did, it's not that I felt bad for him. I was just like, he just looks so frustrated, poor guy. Oh, it was great. The mm. the video <laughs> uploader widget from Vidyard that we used is in its beta uh, stages still. And so there's no confirmation once you uploaded your video or finished your webcam recording. And it also potentially, if you weren't really paying attention to the end of the type form survey, made some people think that their entire application had been lost. So there was this one guy who who uploaded um, his webcam recorded video with the title, I think uploading this video just deleted my entire application. And it was six seconds of him sitting on his bed, just he kind was. of looking <laughs> off, wondering what went wrong. <laughs> and then... The best part. Was his second video <laughs> entitled... I think uploading this video may have deleted my entire application, part two. Part two, that's the best part. Which was four seconds long. (laughs) And him on his bed again, looking around, wondering where his application was. And of course, on our end, we've got two applications from him and two videos from him. um, And he doesn't know. Oh, um, it was great, though. He definitely gave me a great laugh, so I appreciate it. It was. But, you know, I mean, <laughs> even that was one of those moments that, like, okay, well, from he, a culture standpoint, this guy would fit in oh, here. Oh, yeah, definitely. So let's move him on to that next level of internal review. Mm-hmm. But that was just, uh, again, it's not about what you say as much as it is just kind of how you say it. Like, yeah. Just give us, give us a chance to, to get to know you. So Yeah, if you can make me laugh that hard. And then uh, eventually we went back to uh, then the people who hadn't uploaded a video mm-hmm. And I think what we found was that the rate column was one of the best indicators, one of the most consistent indicators of level of experience and level of talent, Mm -hmm. which was surprising to me how well it correlated with the quality of work. work Because there's a certain, um, I think think there are certain types of people who like to um, overqualify themselves yeah. Right. They may be at uh, an intermediate intermediate level of proficiency with something, but they say advanced. Mm-hmm. And then there are some people who sell themselves short. Right. And so they say like, you know, beginner when they're really intermediate yeah. or intermediate if they really are advanced. And and, and so there's there's a little bit of um, is it subjectivity or objectivity? I, never, I can never remember which one is which there. Little, anyway, a little bit of a little bit <laughs> of personal, person. yeah, a little bit of personal bias in there. But what we found then was the the group of people who put themselves in that like fifteen to twenty five dollar an hour range, which was at least half of the applicants. Mm-hmm. Um, 
did work that that just didn't meet a level of of what we we need right now. Yeah. Now with some of those people, I'll admit there was some basic talent there. Yeah. And when they followed up, I would enc- I encourage them to keep going, mm-hmm. to keep doing what they're doing. But then the people who were charging the sixty, seventy five, a hundred dollars an hour, they're doing really good work yeah. and. You know, we could look at their work, and we knew that there would be a good a good skill level fit mm-hmm. um, for the types of projects that we work on. So, um, it was, as far as I can tell, the most efficient way to get through a hundred plus applicants for something like that. I, I feel like so. we've probably got at least a dozen editors that we feel like are on our roster now, mm-hmm. who we can, and some of them we've already done a project or two with. Yeah. Um, Anna was a part, was a part of this, right? Anna, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that was a very time consuming process, but also more efficient given the volume, mm-hmm. um, than anything that we'd done before. Especially, yeah. Um, I want to touch on two other platforms, uh, and then we'll hear from our sponsor. There's a local company called Uncompany that we have recently signed up for their on deck service. Yes. Um, you're kind of managing the relationship with them. Tell mm-hmm. us a little bit about what Uncompany does, at least for their on deck service yeah so they um have a database full of freelancers that um freelancers can go through and find work through own company or companies like us can go through and find freelancers so they have an on deck platform where basically we talk to uncompany um tell them what we are in need of tell them what we're looking for they um go through and send us a spreadsheet of potential people for um, those jobs. So basically, like we had the the freelance um, copywriter, creative lead, strategist. So we had talked with them about those and sent them um, those needs, and they came back with a like a like two or three mm-hmm. for each role. And so then we go through and vet them. And but those mm-hmm. people are all vetted by Uncompany, exactly. which yeah. is important. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. everyone, every freelancer is vetted by Uncompany. Um, first before they send it to us Um, and then we go through and see how we feel about them based on what was sent and then um, we tell them who we want on deck so we have a deck (laughs) a bench a bench there you go i was like Mm -hmm. i knew it was specific um where we can go through and based on a project we can see who works best but we already have that list of vetted people on our bench that we can go through, which is pretty cool if you think about it, because that way we don't have to go through, you know, hundreds or thousands of right. freelancers. We already have a list of, you know, five editors or MoGraph people who that we already know we would like to work with. So it's just for any kind of rush job, too. It's just it's just nice to have. Yep. Pre-vetted, ready mm-hmm. to go. Yeah. They're not we're not putting a hold on any of their time. No. Um, but we're also tomorrow uh thursday same thing um (laughs) by the time this episode is released we will have just met to that entire team that is true yeah uh, and also been able to tell them a little bit more about Mm -hmm. the work that we do the opportunities that we might have and and so it's kind of this like um bench deck (laughs) deck of uh, it's like a bench of freelancers on deck ready to go whenever we do have something for them what's nice about the way that uncompany works is that um, we don't actually have to pay anything until we do any work with these mm-hmm. people. Um, so their business model is largely based in, in the margin that they add to the hourly rate that they and they negotiate that hourly rate with us. They negotiate a separate hourly rate with the freelancers, and we just pay on company whenever that work is billed, and they take care of everything else. Yeah, and they also have, um, like Ben said, we're meeting everyone. They have a onboarding process where. They're going to introduce everyone. Um, everybody's going to give a little bit of info about, you know, what they're doing. We're going to give it info about storyboard, things like that. So it's not like they're just passing them along to us. They're like right. handing them to us with a like kind of playbook and everything like that. Yep. And then uh, and, and it's worth noting that that we have known the um, management and founders at Uncompany for several years. Um, they're here local in the Triangle. Um, and then there's another company that that showed up on our radar radar about a year ago, um, and we just recently reengaged them. It's a platform uh, out of Canada called Communo. Their model's a little bit different. Um, 
they uh, they basically just create a marketplace where agencies and companies can interact with and meet uh, creative freelancers, mm-hmm. um, and we can negotiate anything with anybody Mm -hmm. for any particular project. Um, But as a company or as an agency, we pay a monthly fee to have access to those people. So they've got something along the lines of 65,000 freelancers on their site. Yeah, I know they blew up during COVID. So again, I think there's part of that uh, vetting that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. Um, Camino has some verified and vetted Freelancers, I believe freelancers pay extra or pay something um, uh, to be able to be verified and vetted. Um, But again, you can go through and you can search for video editors, animators, writers, content strategists, data analysts, whatever it is that you may need. You get a list of those people. And then what's nice is you can create uh, a bench there where if you liked the profiles or like the conversations with you that you had with three or four uh, script writers, you could actually create a bench and then post the job to your bench mm-hmm. um, with a particular uh, job and let them kind of bid on it. But uh, again, all of those communications could be independent also, um, allowing you to develop those individual relationships with those uh, freelancers. Okay, should we hear from Beer Gear? Oh, yes, we Great. should. Okay, so Beer Gear has come out with a new product called, you ready for it? I don't know, am I? I think so. Vino Chinos. It's pants specifically designed for storing wine. Okay. So you can get your business casual chinos that have a built-in wine glass holder on the side. So you can walk around your local winery looking fancy and have your hands free to waft and swirl while still having your own wine right in your pocket. I mean, imagine if you're tasting a selection of reds and, and one of them is just like super buttery. That's a I callback. don't know what that means. No, it's, it's, it's a callback to our sponsor from our last episode. <laughs> um, I'll leave that there. Um, okay, well, welcome to Beer Gear. We're excited to have them. And uh, have mm-hmm. you tried the Vino Chinos? No, but I have tried the Ale Nails. Where you can dip your nails in, and it turns the color of what kind of beer you're drinking. Oh, interesting! I thought ale nails would have been, you know, super hard nails so that you could just open up. That's actually a, a lot better. We need to tell them. Maybe that's um, maybe that's like a beer tickle cuticle kind. Of that's what I say it has to rhyme. That's yeah, what beer gear no, is all about. That, that's 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 been made very clear. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, shout out to Beer Gear. Woo. Welcome use my use my coupon code JBATS for seventy five percent off. Wow, seventy five percent off. Yeah, they off. really need the business. Whew. All right, um, great. So let's talk a bit about how to manage a roster. How do you manage all of that information and those uh, profiles? Um, if you're a larger marketing team with a bunch of freelance needs or you're a video agency with a bunch of, of freelancer mm-hmm. opportunities. I mean, we typically keep, uh, on any given year, we typically pay out somewhere between 50 to 70 free contractors Yeah. over the course of a year. Mm-hmm. How do you manage that many people and just remember who's who? I mean, that's something we're still actively trying to do our best to figure out. Because um, what do we have? We have our... Google Sheet. We got a Google Sheet <laughs> that is um, wanting. Yes. I mean, it's a start. It is. It's definitely a start because then, you know, you can have different columns for, you know, the real contact information, but it, it is it does leave some lacking. But, like, I feel like, so I'm pulling it up now, yeah. which isn't fair to our audience, <laughs> uh, unless we add this in post, which we probably shouldn't because there's an awful lot of <laughs> personal information <laughs> yeah. here. So just put a big blurry thing up on the, the screen. color-coordinated. Honestly, I feel like our contractor database, don't take this personally, is, <laughs> is where potential freelancers go to die. I mean, it's true, though, because when's the last time we, I mean, we haven't really looked at it at that much, you like, know? Like, given all of our recent editing needs, I haven't once thought of Jim or yeah. DJ mm-hmm. uh, or 
I mean, Sierra doesn't even have any information. Just, yeah. just a name. I know. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it's not a, um, I mean, it's better than nothing, yeah. right? Uh, first name, last name, phone number, email, company, primary role, secondary role, tertiary role. I think that's important, right? Oh, yeah. Because there's so many freelancers who do multiple things. Yeah, like shooter editors, you know, whatever. Or shooter predator, editor. The pr- producer yeah. slash editor, the yeah. predator. That was a fun one. That was. Um, and, uh, you know, when you get into post-production, I mean, you could have someone who's an editor, a colorist, mm-hmm. um, audio post, and a post-production supervisor. Yeah. And we only have three columns for mm-hmm. what they're able to do. And, and it's just it's just hard to remember, especially until you've worked with someone for the first time. I think that's... Yeah. There, there are probably plenty of talented people, honestly, on our uh, contractor database that just because of the nature of how we've met them and and maybe have or haven't talked to them mm-hmm. uh we haven't utilized them because they don't they aren't first of mind yeah top of mind um standard rate i think this is hugely important it but is. it's also something that we just for some for whatever reason haven't really filled out on here Mm-mm. um previously worked with is important Ooh, ranking that sounds like a good idea <laughs> um but it's also empty notes which mm-hmm. I think it's important for anybody to be able to put in, uh, you know, like one of our former freelance editors who got a full-time job. Yeah. Right? Like, okay, well, she's not going to be the first person that we go to on something because we know she's got the full-time job. But if we really need something, maybe we can see if she's got some time, nights, and weekends that she'd be willing to, yeah, exactly. uh, to put to something. So it's a start. Um, however, we are on the search for something better. Yeah. I was hoping to come up with something better than better. (laughs) Uh, Something more usable. Something more um, utilitarian. Oh, there you go. There we go. That's a... Found it. That's a fancy word. Third time's charm. (laughs) And so we've talked to a couple different platforms Mm -hmm. that position themselves as freelancer contractor management. Um, But as I recall, we found that they were... um, they were trying to do a lot more than we needed. They were. They were trying to get all freelancers onboarded onto their platform, which right. a lot of our freelancers, be they nice. don't want that. <laughs> well, no, it's not. It's because I would be the same way. I don't want to be like onboarded onto another platform and then like another payment platform and just have all right. these platforms to have to go through. And so it was more so just a lot more work that our freelancers have to put in that we didn't want them necessarily to have to put in well and we have an existing database of i don't even know how many total contractors Mm -hmm. that we want to have that control over putting that information we don't want to have to invite someone to uh, a platform exactly and then rely on them to put in the information that either they've already given us or that Mm -hmm. we found by researching them or talking to them or, or whatever it just it just feels well plus inefficient yeah one of our one of our columns that we definitely want to look at is also the notes column where if we want to put something you know like uh this person was is more suited for um interview case study style Mm -hmm. something like that that you necessarily don't want your freelancers to see everything but right (laughs) not a bad way terrible (laughs) communicator fantastic (laughs) editor uh give yourself an extra couple days (laughs) exactly uh, Uh, yeah um those internal notes are important how would you describe our ideal platform because i think we've tried to do this with a couple different places and 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 we just haven't found that fit so part of this could even be a plea to our audience if they've come across a platform like this to give us a heads up but what is it that we're looking to do what what do we want if we had to make this platform Mm -hmm. what would it include i just want kind of a platform that i can go to type in which of our freelancers I'm looking for, like editor, whatever. And so then role. Role, no, yes. Okay. And then all the editors would come up, either it's, you know, just their names in a little bubble, their faces, whatever, anything like that, be able to click on that and then see all the work that they've done for us, any reels, pretty much every single bit of information that we have on the contractor database, but just not in such a big spread out spreadsheet yeah yeah spreadsheet spread out like a spreadsheet yep. 
and just you know be able to put notes and then actually click on the videos see the videos everything like that i think that's that's what i want just a vis- more visual way of finding the freelancers yeah and maybe even an easier way just to put that information but the, yeah i mean that that's the thing too is we've got all of this data now from our freelance video editor applicants mm-hmm. that i'd love to just dump into some kind of friendly interface mm-hmm. where and, and you know i think it it may sound silly to some people but yeah i want to see their face like i want to see a headshot well yeah it's not i mean it's just because it helps me remember who it is like, right that, exactly that's just <laughs> yeah i'm not really good with names like like tell me what rich was good at but like if mm-hmm. you can see his face it clicks. then you're like oh yeah rich i remember talking mm-hmm. to him about quick turnaround yeah. times or whatever yep but it's also that right now we do have the contractor database we do have the freelance video editor spreadsheet so it's just like a bunch of spreadsheets that you just want to and put all into one place yeah so if any of you out there have a platform like that or are or aware of a to, platform like want that to create one or want to make one for us feel free that'd be great one thing that I don't have on here on notes um, under managing a roster or database, I mm-hmm. think it's worth noting that we do and have for several years paid all of our contractors through Gusto. Mm-hmm. So Gusto is a platform that we use for our employee payroll. Uh, we can also have an unlimited number of contractors on there. And what's nice about that is they get paid via direct deposit. We don't have to print out, mail any checks, worry about checks getting lost, anything like that. Go Gusto. Woo. I don't know. Maybe I bet I bet we have an affiliate link for Gusto and we can put that like up on the screen here. That's true. That'd be great. To wrap up, let's I'm going to let you talk about effective ways to communicate with freelancers. Yeah. Because if keeping their like personal information and mm-hmm. profile information organized is a chore. Mm-hmm. I imagine when we're actually working with them, organizing communication can be a chore also. So mm-hmm. uh, please give us some <laughs> best practices on communicating with freelancers. I guess the first thing that I do is I have a little a little note card, or a little, not n- note card, it's the notes on your laptop, so whatever. Kind of ex- a step-by-step thing of what I like to onboard our freelancers on or ways of communication. So we do have... Slack, we create a Slack channel each time that we have a new freelancer working on a project just so that we can communicate with them, just with them on that certain project and them not have to be included in all the other projects mm-hmm. going on with the client. And then- Now, specifically mm-hmm. we can do that because we can add them as a single member guest. Yes. So they don't have to go against our user count on Correct. Slack. Correct, yeah, which is very helpful. Yes, okay. Um, and then we like to, onboard them onto Google Drive. So create, we have on Google Drive client folders and then within each client folder, we'll have a um, to slash from the freelancer. So that way, if there's any uh, links or you know project files or if they're, especially like copywriter, so they can go ahead and create you know a Google doc within that folder for us. And so like within that client, so we can read everything like that, which makes it easier. Okay. And they have access to everything in the folder. We also have Frame.io. So we like to, we like to basically share any first cuts, final cuts with internally and in with, with the client on Frame.io, just because it's so easy to put in notes and it makes it easier. So any kind of editing um, motion graphics, anything like that, we like to go ahead and add them to our Frame.io as well. Just make it easier for everyone. I Let's see, we also use Calendly. I think mm-hmm. Calendly is a great resource for freelancers because, for example, like we do our springboards and we have stakeholder conversations. And right now we're working with, uh, like Ben had mentioned before, five different strategists Mm -hmm. on different springboards so instead of me having to go to each one and say hey what's your availability like this day this day this day and then have to go back to the client and say hey what's your availability this day we can't do this day blah 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 it's everybody can just be onboarded onto calendly i send a link to the client i'm like hey here's the best or here's the link choose what's what's best for you i think that's a great resource because then is, you know, none of your information is shown on Calendly. Mm-hmm. It just shows what times you are available. Each of those freelancers 
can connect up to six mm -hmm. of their own digital calendars. Yes. Um, so depending on how, I can't imagine having more than one digital calendar, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> should they, they can do that so that, uh, one, they don't have to share their calendar with us. Like mm -hmm. if they don't want to sing when they have to go pick up the kid. Yeah. Right? Like, I mean, first of all, we don't care about that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> But but like if for some reason you know they don't want to they don't want us to see their calendar mm -hmm. all it does is just it just shows available times exactly is there anything else about freelancers that the good people should know yeah I feel like if you're a freelancer and you're listening right now I think raise your hand <laughs> okay okay good to know good to yep. know basically just communicate that's like mm. my biggest thing if you communicate with me and just let me know. I'm forever grateful to you because even if it's you communicating saying, hey, I'm not gonna be able to get this done by the deadline, which hopefully won't happen, but um, at least I'll know instead of me having to come to you in the day of and you know ask where it is and everything. It's just communication is key for everything in every aspect of life, if you yeah. think about it. You know what? That's true. Is that a good note to end on? The more you communication? know. Yes. Do we have a rainbow? <laughs> we can. Uh, you heard it here, y'all. Communicate more. Communicate. Uh, no, that's great. Let's um, uh, let's quickly hear from our sponsor, Beer Gear, again. We have our Vino Chinos. All right. So you want to go to the winery, but you don't know how many wines you want to taste? Oh, don't worry. You can taste up to three. One in your Vino Chino side pocket, and then two in one hand. You can have a red, a white, and a rosé all at the same time. Wow. I know, your mind is blown. <laughs> uh, speechless. <laughs> and remember, JBATS for sponsor code up to 75% off. Yep, 75% off. Sounds like a fire sale, but apparently they're new. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, great. <laughs> then, quick recap. Um, freelancers. We talked a little bit about some of the traditional roles that are kept in-house and, and roles that are often sought for freelancers, but we also talked about putting processes in place so that you can actually leverage uh, freelancers and contract, uh, contractors uh, in some of those more traditionally in-house roles. We talked about where to find them. Mm -hmm. We talked about our cheating on LinkedIn <laughs> and then create using Typeform to create a database, an, an application that is essentially a database mm -hmm. of freelance video editor information is how we use it. Um, send us yours if you decide to do something like that. I yeah. uh, would love to see it. Talked a little bit about our friends at Uncompany and our mm -hmm. friends at Communo. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about our journey to find a platform to manage all of these people. And yeah. we're still looking for that. And we talked a little bit about how to communicate. And ultimately, the answer is communicate more. Communicate more. In oh, everything. That's such a philosophical. Yeah, that's, that's what we aim for. <laughs> philosophy within an hour and a half <laughs> we um, could have just summed it up right at the beginning we could have but we've never planned that far ahead that we know where <laughs> we're gonna end so um i don't know if you've ever watched or listened to this podcast before but it's uh no you haven't i have i, okay. I, I knew the harry dumbledore thing <laughs> That's, true. But that is true. Bellatrix to your Voldemort. Yep. All right. Well, then that uh, that ends this very special Justinless episode of everyone's favorite the Video Reformation Podcast. Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for oh, joining yeah. us. Thanks for having me. Uh, I would encourage our audience to like and subscribe and do all those things. But I'd also love to hear your feedback on Jacqueline's performance. Oh, be nice. Uh, we'll only share the nice ones with her. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, yeah. Do you, do you want more Jacqueline is the question. Oh, please say no. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that's it for this episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. Thanks for watching. Bye.